So much of the world's data lies in spreadsheets and log files and other similar structured formats, just waiting for deeper insights to be gleaned from them. We can now do better than simply fitting a linear regression without that much more work. So let's give it a shot. My name is Yufeng Guo, and I am a developer advocate for Google Cloud. Today, I'm going to show you how to use TensorFlow to do classification of structured data, the easy way. The simplest definition of machine learning I can come up with is down to six words, using many examples to answer questions. Let's break that statement up into its two main parts, training and prediction. They are both equally important, because your training needs to answer a real question you have, and not just provide a high accuracy score. A common approach is to test locally with smaller data sets, and then move to the cloud for processing a larger data set. The tool we're going to be using today is TensorFlow, an open source machine learning library from Google, which was released in November of 2015. Since then, it's become a very popular tool for both training models as well as a way to communicate research. So where does the name TensorFlow come from, and what does it mean? The name refers to tensors flowing along a computational graph. But what are tensors? Well, tensors are simply just another word for an array or a matrix, but for any number of dimensions rather than just one or two. For example, uh, let's see some tensors here flowing along a graph with the 2 and the 3 flowing into an addition operator and outputting a 5. This is example may be simple, but it illustrates an important concept in TensorFlow, and that is the deferred execution model. This means that the graph has to be constructed before any inputs are fed into it. We'll see some more examples of this later in the code. Let's do a little thought experiment together. Say you're creating a hot new startup which aims to predict what its users want to eat. It's going to be great. Here's the plan. Someone says to the app, I want fried chicken. And they get some, say, chicken waffles. Completely original, I know. Naturally, you launch and iterate it. Your V1 uses naive text matching. And when your users ask for fried chicken, they get chicken fried rice. Oops. Not exactly what they were looking for. That's all right. You say, aha, I know machine learning. Let me use a linear model and memorize my user's preferences. So you build a linear or wide model. And now your users get chicken and waffles when they ask for fried chicken. Wonderful. So you deploy your V2 release with your wide linear model and your app begins to gain traction. Alas, no good deed goes unpunished, and now your users are bored. They don't want to be getting chicken and waffles every single time that they ask for fried chicken. They want some variety. So you go back to your machine learning tool belt, whip out deep learning. All right. Deep learning allows data to be embedded into a space such that items which are similar are closer together in that space. This allows you to generalize the items which are similar to one another since they end up close together. So you implement your deep model, and you release your v3. As we're beginning to see, your users are quite picky. And naturally, now that you have created a version that generalizes well, when your users ask for something like a, say, iced decaf latte with nonfat milk, your app sometimes delivers them a hot latte with whole milk. Not quite what we want. So. How do we balance the requests of users, both specific requests and general requests, and not bore them? A few years ago, Google Research published a paper which provided a way to balance these two models and their benefits, which are one side good at memorization, aka a wide model, and the models that are good at generalization, deep models. They call the model wide and deep and an implementation is available built into TensorFlow, ready for your data set to be plugged into. One way you can conceptualize why using wide and deep models together yields great results is to imagine that the deep part of the model generalizes the solution, gets things mostly right, while the wide side memorizes exceptions. This allows for the overall model 
to have greater accuracy than either one could alone, as they're covering for each other's weaknesses. So that's it for story time and our little thought experiment. Join me in part two of this video as we dive into the TensorFlow code and see how this can be implemented. And the tool we're going to use today is TensorFlow, a machine library, a machine learning li The tool today, the tool I'm going to be, wow. <laughs>